Good evening. Uh, if I could ask everyone to now take their seats and quiet things down a bit. Uh, we're going to move into the next phase of our uh, event this evening. Uh, this event is being sponsored by the James Bay Neighborhood Environment Association and the James Bay Community School. Um, essentially what's going to happen this evening is um, we're going to give each of the council candidates about two, two and a half minutes to uh, speak to you. Um, and uh, at, after that we will go with the mayor, mayor candidates and uh, they will have the same opportunity to speak to you. Following that, there is um, some forms at the back you can fill out, and uh, we're gonna have to, we can't just take a whole pile of random questions, but if there's some questions with some real commonality, there will be a couple of people that are gonna take it off into a room and try and see the, the best quality, or the, the things you're most interested in, do, those questions do get asked, okay? So if I could ask everybody to quiet down, and uh, my first speaker this evening is Sean Murray. To the podium. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sean Murray, and I call myself a soft capitalist. Can you hear me? myself a soft capitalist from the political center. If elected, I will work for a clean, green environment. I want to ensure public ownership and control of our fresh water supply. I would like to reduce parking fines by 25%. I believe this will liberate money which can be spent on the private sector, and the key to a healthy economy is a strong private sector. I would like a balanced approach to development. This means between high-end condominiums and low-cost housing and rental suites. I would like to implement wheelchair-friendly bylaws. New uh, condominiums and apartment buildings should be equipped with uh, push-button door openers so that people in wheelchairs don't have to wait for someone to open the door for them. I would support the arts. I would aim for fiscal responsibility. I would like to improve tourism by implementing secondary sewage treatment. I believe many people boycott Victoria as the destination due to our lack of secondary treatment. This project would create jobs and our solid sewage can be used to fertilize newly planted trees and possibly convert it into methane gas to power our city. This would be a little bit expensive, but I see it as an investment that would pay for itself in the long run. I am in favor of legal basement suites and I would be an advocate of low cost housing. I do stand for a safe injection site, not too close to city centre, as to exactly where we could put that to a committee. Thank you. Thank you. John Turner. John C. Turner, for your advice on City Council. My name is John C. Turner, and I've been a community support worker and a street advocate, or a street councillor, for 16 years. I've been a children's and youth advocate and mentor for 20 years, and I've been an international socioeconomic development strategist and advisor for international social and economic development projects for 14 years. My, the platform I'm running on is a nonpartisan community developments platform, building a community, an alternative and complementary community economy. Now, the, some of the components that this would address include the development of an alternative community-based transportation infrastructure that will not incur any substantial carryover debt, starting with the Squamal Harbour Sea, the virtually immediate initiation of a Squamal Harbour Sea bus, and then an integrated light rail development strategy over three to five years. The uh, community issues are community volunteerism. It would provide community volunteerism, social rehabilitation, getting our people on the street, off the street, and into the community where they can be most beneficial through community internships, community scholarships, community education, 
community employment and provisional waging, community entrepreneurialism, community commerce development, and the creation of a community economy, and a tax decrement strategy for people in the general community who contribute to these uh, financial and social economic str social strategy, development strategies. Uh, community housing options and living subsidies. The, the community housing options would include the development of Hotel Richminster International Community Housing Cooperative, which would house our community employees and be managed on a zero tolerance basis. Uh, Two minutes. Community beautification projects, a community hall, a community college, community school, and community lifestyles enhancement programs for each of the communities along the, along the infrastructure. Thank you very much. I'm John C. Turner. Please vote for me on November 19th. Thank you. Pamela Madoff. I was looking everywhere for you, Pamela, and there you were already. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Can you hear? Thanks very much, Tim, and thank you everyone for coming this evening. My name is Pam Madoff. Can you hear? And I moved back to James Bay in 1984 and immediately discovered what being a part of the community is all about. Became very involved with my neighbors, became very involved with the James Bay Community Project, with the medical clinic, with the community school, and also the South Park Family School, all of which were really created by community activists who had come before I had, long before I had moved back to Victoria. In 1993, I came forward and asked for your support in being elected to Victoria City Council. And it seems very appropriate to be here tonight at the first general all candidates meeting back in James Bay. In the, in the 1990s, we had an extraordinary amount of community interest and community involvement. And that's what certainly inspired me to move forward. It's what I still continue to see in how we engage with our communities. So for me, when I stand before you and ask you to consider supporting me for City Council, I'm not so much wanting to come forward with a list of things that I might promise to do, but rather to give you just a small snapshot of how I make decisions on Council. I believe in lifelong learning. I believe in a continuum of education as a, as a member of Council. I believe in being informed by community, community discussion, and community involvement. My experience on Council has been really such a, created such a richness for me. I'm currently on the Greater Victoria Harbour Authority where I'm working very hard on putting in place a new governance model. I'm also on the board of the, Victor of the Greater Victoria Library, which for the first time has developed a facilities plan that has been supported unanimously by the board, but also by all of our other uh, sister municipalities. So it's these kinds of initiatives that I'd like to be able to continue to work on. Arts and culture is something I've been very involved with. Certainly heritage preservation and rehabilitation. Urban planning, how our city grows. We know it's going to change, but how is it going to change? And how can we make sure that community voices are heard and help to, help to inform the decisions that we make on your behalf on council? Time time. So on November 19th, I would hope you would look at my track record, and if you felt you could support me, I'd be very appreciative. Thank you very much. My name is Pam Madoff. Nate Lucas. Hi, uh, thanks for coming out tonight and for uh, the organizers of this meeting. My name is Philippe Lucas and I'm uh, running for re-election as a Victoria City Councillor and SCRD Director. Over the last three years, I've worked hard to make pragmatic, well-informed decisions and represent your voice on City Council and the CRD. I was the only City Councillor to vote against this year's 7% residential tax increase and to support keeping a rail crossing as part of the new Johnson Street Bridge project. I've taken a leadership role in efforts to stop the installation of Wi-Fi smart meters, and I've been leading the way on urban agriculture and food security issues, working with the community to bring a downtown public market back to Victoria. And at the CRD, I was the only director to vote in favour of, uh, of keeping our upcoming sewage treatment project 100% public. And I'm working hard to protect unique natural resources like the Juan de Fuca Trail and our region's farmland. Finally, I'm a strong advocate for harm reduction in our region, including a supervised consumption site, which would save lives and money. I've also been working on the many issues and challenges that are unique to James Bay. Air quality is incredibly important to our environment and our health. That's why I voted to maintain the CRD's regional air quality monitoring program when staff recommended ending this important function. In regards to float planes and helicopters, 
I believe the federal government should update their environmental impact air quality assessments and then actively monitor these parameters. 30 seconds. In regards to cruise ships, I believe the Greater Victoria Harbour Authority should be obliged to provide an electric plug-in option at Ogden Point to develop a transportation strategy that prioritizes pedestrian, cycle, and non-motorized transportation options. And finally, your voice matters and so does your community plan. That's why I voted against proposed redevelopment of the Admiral Inn Hotel. This neighborhood needs more family housing, not million dollar condos. To conclude, over the next three years, I'm going to promote strategies to protect our environment, boost our local economy, improve food security, increase civic engagement, reduce poverty, homelessness, and addiction in our region, and create a more aging family Victoria. So on November 19th, we elect Philippe Lucas to Victoria City Council and CRD, and let's keep working together for a better Victoria. Thank you very much. Dan is it? Is he here? No? Okay. Aaron Hall. He is. Slipped in late out. Yes. You've got two minutes, Ben, and uh, you'll get a signal at that point, and you've got another 30 seconds at that Thanks point. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, my name is Ben Isett, and I'm asking for your vote for City Council and the CRD Board on Saturday, November 19th to change Victoria for the better. I love this city. I am a parent, homeowner, teacher, author, and dedicated community activist, and I'm committed to the future of this place. Working together with the people in this room, both the other candidates, but also all of you in the gallery, as well as our strong community organizations to improve this, the quality of life for everyone. Over the past two months, I have door to door canvassed every corner of this city, meeting voters and hearing your concerns. I have heard how middle income earners, seniors, youth, and working people are being squeezed by the rising cost of living in the midst of a global economic crisis. I have heard how people want our neighborhoods, like James Bay, to be more safe and friendly for walking, cycling, and for community life. I have heard support for forward-looking ideas, like urban agriculture, a better transit system, and stronger libraries and community centers. And I, have heard, and I have heard concern, oh, one minute. 30 seconds. Okay, and I have heard concern over the growing gap between rich and poor, economic inequality that contributes to a range of social problems. In my professional life, I'm a historian, author, and legal scholar. I hold a PhD, an LLB, but I also have hands-on experience working in the trenches, working with the Kool-Aid Society, uh, developing hands-on experience with the hardest to house, where I've seen the need for a housing first policy and a harm re reduction policy. I've also served on the board of my community association, viewing um, the need for neighborhood appropriate development challenging the view of growth at any cost, including high-rise towers that threaten to destroy the character of our neighborhoods. Yeah. Do we have 30 bucks? No. Thank you very much. I'd urge you to lend me your vote on Saturday, November 19th. I apologize. I wasn't able. I didn't catch it before uh, the meeting. Aaron Hall? We're trying to be as fair as possible to everybody. Good evening everyone, my name is Aaron Hall. Who am I? Uh, born and raised in Victoria. I've lived in every neighborhood in this city. I'm a father. I've got two kids who went to this school for six years. Um, spent a lot of time in the mustard seed as a child. My parents helped create the uh, street outreach center and the street church there. Um, why am I running? Uh, I want to bring open government to the city of Victoria. Uh, I have a real estate practice and I run it open. And uh, a lot of people don't know what that means, but basically it means that you need information and we want to provide it to you. Um, what are my concerns? I think that my, one of my chief concerns is that the municipal spending is not based on a realistic budget. Uh, as a business person for a long time, that I feel that the spending is not, it's not based on how much money is coming in and how much money is going out. It's based on ideas that are not founded on, on a realistic budget of what we can afford and what is practical for us. So um, another thing that I want to spend a lot of time on is I want to identify what is a municipal issue and what is a regional issue. We hear a lot about LRT and sewage treatment and what is the city's role in that and the questions that come to me from the public are 
um, seeming that it is the city's responsibility to maintain that when it should be a joint effort with all of the municipalities. And, and I'm not seeing in the media or in the public that that is happening. Uh, another thing that I really want to work on and that I'm passionate about is the, the development of the city. Now people have a, a development is a swear word. You know, um, I love our character neighborhoods. I live in a hundred year old house. I've only lived in hundred year old houses. 30 seconds. I think that our development should be happening more downtown. Um, I think the one part of development that is really missing is the uh, our businesses are leaving, and they're a big part of our community. And when I know people that live downtown and their businesses are leaving from downtown to Lankford, that's uh, that's disturbing. And so that's what I'm up to. October or November, vote for Open Victoria. Thank Next you. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, many neighborhoods are looking forward toward having very little change and, and want stability. James Bay is, a, is an example of a neighborhood that in the past has gone through a lot of upheaval and uncertainty with regard to, to Three zones. seconds. Um, it's produced a great neighborhood, uh, but certainly over the process there was a lot of uh, pain and, and consequent activism. Uh, on November 19th, I'd ask that you give me one of your votes for council and one of your votes for Capital Regional District. I'm Jeff Young. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Mary Ann Alton. Okay, we got extra time for being short. <laughs> Sorry about the snap, by the way. If they tell me if I leave the mic on for the whole That's three hours, it'll die. <laughs> say the chivalry is there. Uh, hi, I'm Marianne Oto and I'm a facilitator by trade. Uh, what I do in that job is I bring people together, I find their common ground, and I get results. Less than a year ago, you gave me the honor of electing me in a by-election as a city councillor. So I've only been a city councillor for a year. It's been an incredible year and I think that I've accomplished a lot. I've managed to secure city council approval for an integrated plan that will help our most vulnerable residents get the support and the health services that they need. I propose short-term incentives to support uh, building new rental housing, and I've secured council support for a comprehensive, open government plan that's already in place, big surprise, that's gonna give you uh, easy access to information that you can not just read, but use and manipulate and do whatever you want with it, and it's going to bring city council to your computer screens and your TV, whether you want it or not. Uh, I've set up regular open door sessions in both of my liaison communities at Vic West and Oakland's where people can just walk in and talk to me about anything that they want uh, once a month for three hours. I've made planning decisions that preserve our heritage but also look to the future with appropriate development options that I'm really proud of. I've made Victoria just the second community in all of Canada to be a blue community which means that we don't sell bottled water in city facilities and we've protected our public water assets to be publicly owned forever. And I've done all this by working with you, by listening to you, being there for you, answering your questions, taking your ideas, and having you as the facilitator of my work. I love this job. I want to do this again. If I think I can get all of this done in one year, just imagine what we can do together in three. I would ask for your support in the 19th for Victoria City Council and for CRD Director, because I believe that I have the skills to work with you to get the job done. Vote to get the job done. Vote Alto, top of the ballot. Thank you. Lisa Helps. Good evening, everybody. I am Lisa Helps, and someone said, wow, I really don't like your campaign slogan. And I said, that is the name I was born with. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a little story to tell you a little bit about how I work. So I run an organization that I founded two years ago. It's called Community Microlending. And we make loans to people in Victoria who don't qualify for credit from banks, but who want to start small businesses. So we walk alongside them, provide, with, provide them with mentorship and support as they walk out of poverty and become business people, right here in our community. So I was leaving the community microlending gathering place, we call it that, not an office, uh, to come here this evening. And as I was going out, coming in the door was the retired chief financial officer of Abe Books, to become a mentor to a young woman in her early 20s who makes all natural jewelry. Now what you ask could possibly be the connection between these two people. She wants to sell her jewelry online. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because this is how I work. I bring people together with a diversity of interests, a diversity of experiences to get things done. And the thing that we're doing at Community Microlending, and part of the reason that I'm running for City Council, is we're doing something innovative. What we're doing is business creation and poverty reduction at the very same time. So that's one of the reasons I'm running. What do I want to do when I get there? I have three main priorities. One is to look at the big picture and to create an infrastructure priority plan. So we're building a new bridge, that's fine. We've got a crumbling swimming pool, that's not so good. Are we going to do LRT? Are we going to do sewage? We need to look at the big picture for the next 30 years and think, what are we going to do with our infrastructure? How are we going to pay for it? Priority number one. 
Priority number two at City Hall is to engage citizens in a meaningful way, have meaningful citizen input. I've worked on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the Official Community Plan, and that's a great start. One of my key platform items, and you'll see this on my page, is to start a participatory budgeting process. What do those big words mean? Get citizens involved in making decisions about how their money is spent at City Hall. Priority number three, and this is actually the one I'm most passionate about, working together with people in their neighborhoods, on their streets, in their families, looking at what citizens are already doing in their neighborhoods, on their streets, with their families, their neighbors, and being the push point at City Hall to say, hey, that's working, let's enable that, let's make more of that. And if you go to my platform page, you'll see some more about that. So Hi. I'm not going to take more time, I've, I'm running out, my name is Lisa Helps, and it really is, and I would love your vote on November the 19th, and I promise to keep working hard, thank you. Thank you. Chris Coleman. Thanks Tim. Can you hear me in the back? Yes? Good, thank you. My name is Chris Coleman. And I've been fortunate enough to be one of your elected representatives for over well, for 12 years, almost 12 years. And during that time, I've not only worked at the local level, for three years I was the liaison to James Bay, and it was um, a fascinating experience. It was a passionate experience. We didn't always agree, and that's okay. But we did move agenda items forward. But I've also been able to work at the provincial level on some issues, at the regional level on some issues, and I presently am one of eight BC representatives on the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, where hopefully we advocate to the federal government that they have to recognize municipal interests more and make sure when we do enable some changes in federal legislation that it allows us to grow communities at the local level. And that's a, a, a mighty uh, problem to try and deal with. Now I have a brochure, a little red one, it's at the back, I didn't put it on the chairs. Um, please go and pick it up. It does have my phone number in it, and you can phone me anytime. Uh, my wife is in the back, so she will put some guidelines around that. You can phone between 8.30 in the morning and 9 at night. Oh, it looks like 10 actually, no 9. Um, sorry, hon. Um, but it's because the iterative discussion is actually how we build community that's important. I've met many of you on the streets in James Bay. I'm now the liaison to Fernwood. I do some open doors there. But it's about how we engage that conversation on an ongoing basis that then lets us address transportation issues, affordable housing, how we protect a community school which is different than other, communities, other schools in, in communities. It's how we get those issues forward that's critically important. I won't take all my two minutes, Tim. I would like to carry on this job. I happen to think elected officialdom is a noble cause because we're building communities, and I would ask you to vote for Chris Coleman, both for City Council and for the CRD. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. John? Uh, thank you all for uh, coming tonight. I'm uh, John Luton. I'm, uh, uh, Victoria City Councillor now, and I'm uh, seeking uh, re-election on uh, November the 19th. I'm also seeking uh, um, a seat on the board table at the uh, uh, Capital uh, Regional uh, District. You know, three years ago, uh, we came to this uh, room and uh, did a lot of all-candidates meeting, and we heard from uh, the community that uh, housing and homelessness were our most important issues uh, in Victoria, and we did a lot of work uh, on those uh, particular uh, issues over the last three years, and I don't believe the work is done. Uh, with our uh, work, with some teamwork at City Hall, uh, we've created uh, or leveraged nearly uh, 800 new uh, units of affordable uh, housing, uh, supportive uh, housing uh, uh, for different uh, needs in the city. Uh, we've also introduced uh, grants for secondary suites. We developed a uh, garden suites uh, policy um, and incentives to uh, put uh, people back into some of our uh, heritage buildings uh, downtown. Those initiatives are working and, and I think we need to keep up the momentum. Um, we need uh, more rental housing. Uh, rental housing hasn't really been built in any uh, concerted uh, way over the last uh, uh, 30 years. Um, so uh, we are working on a short-term incentive uh, for uh, rental programs 
and i've been talking to my council colleagues and also to the development community and other people in the community about car light housing because twenty two percent of households in victoria don't have vehicles so they don't all need parking and that really drives up the cost of housing so we have to be creative about the kind of solutions we bring forward to develop affordable housing and i think housing and homeless can homelessness continue to be an important issue in the city we want to ensure that people who work in victoria can live in victoria and i think that's the objective of a good housing policy we've done a good bit of work on tackling our infrastructure deficit i think that's very important cities need to renew themselves we took on the bridge it was a difficult issue for a lot of people but we're moving that forward we're able to do it without having an impact on taxes and we've got a lot of work to do on some other issues we're also creating employment zones i'm working with the shipyards as our other members of the council to help them grow and bring more jobs to the city there's a lot of things we can do together you know i don't find it easy always to talk in sound bites so i've got a brochure and a website a lot of information there i think we're making a lot of progress i've got a lot of success in the community working on other issues and we've got a lot more to do on transportation on housing infrastructure and our environmental issues so i'm looking for your vote again on november the 19th and thanks for having me tonight thank you charlene charlene good and joe Good evening. My name is Charlene Thornton Joe, and I'm rerunning for Victoria City Council. Thank you for the, to the organizers for putting this all Canada's meeting together this evening. I am a third generation Victorian and have attended school and university and worked and lived in the capital region most of my life. I have a passion for serving people, and that passion is reflected in my brochure, shows an extensive involvement in many nonprofit organizations, such as the Women's Transition House the Intercultural Association of Greater Victoria, the Lions Society for Children with Disabilities, and the Victoria Chinatown Lioness Club, to name a few. It is that passion for serving people that led me to run for council the first time. And it's that same passion for serving people that has led me to rerun for council today. As a city councillor, I have had the opportunity to be the council liaison to the neighbourhoods of downtown and Harris Green, and currently the council liaison for the Burnside Gorge neighborhood. Through the years, I've also served as liaison to tourism, heritage, planning, and to the Downtown Victoria Business Association. I was the chair of the steering committee for the Mayor's Task Force on Homelessness, Mental Illness, and Addiction, and currently serve on the Greater Victoria Coalition to End Homelessness. As a CRD director, I am on the Parks Committee and was president of the CRD Housing Corporation which runs housing such as Perry Place and is currently building a family housing complex in Sandwich. Other involvement includes being the organizer, organizer of our annual Canada Day celebrations for the last 12 years and working closely on animal, animal welfare issues. I believe that it is important to be accessible. I believe it's important to listen to your concerns and try to address them to the best of my abilities. I also believe in making a balanced decision with an independent mind. If re elected, I am committed to continue to work with you, for you, to address some of the challenges that your neighborhood in Victoria faces. I hope you have a chance to look over my brochure or check out my website at www.charlene.ca. On November 19th, please be sure to vote, and I hope you will say one vote for me, Charlene Thornton Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. My name is Linda McGrew. I'm currently the director of a research and conservation society, and I want to tell you a story of how I got here. I graduated from UVic with a biochemistry and microbiology degree in 2002, where I, oddly enough, started an all-women's painting company and a uh, business consulting company. In 2003, I bought my first house, my first car, and my business quadrupled, but I wasn't happy. In 2004, I sold my painting company, then my car, then my house, and I went searching. I spent my 25th birthday on a beach in Hawaii. 
For almost a year, I did yoga every day, contemplated my life, and explored my definitions of success, love, family, and what I wanted to do. But I didn't take long before I flew myself back home, because I must say it's human nature to go for that challenge. And soon I landed in a desk in a classroom that Jane Sturt was teaching. And for those of you who don't know, Jane Sturt is the leader of the BC Green Party. I thought I had lived through all of these things by then, and I'm sure like all 25 year olds, I thought I knew everything. And it turns out Jane had recently been through some growth and change as well. On that first day in school, she told my classmates and I about her successful computer company in Edmonton and the sale of it allowing her to do what she'd always dreamed, sail around the world. Well, they had planned on sailing for 10 years, and she went out for three months and returned. She returned because she saw how devastated the planet was, and she wanted to do something about it. I sat there and listened and thought, wow, that's the kind of woman I want to be. She's inspiring, passionate, smart, and an advocate for the environment. But that was five years ago, so what's happened since then? I finished my MBA, and from 2007 to 2010, I left Canada and traveled and worked. I worked in education, business consulting, had a socially responsible fashion label, 30 seconds. helped keep children and women off the streets in Indonesia, and learned Mandarin. Now, municipal politics isn't some grand solution to saving the planet, I know. I don't have illusions of winning a Nobel Peace Prize by doing this. But municipal decisions, made in large part on infrastructure, land use, and services, do have both short and long-term effects on our environment. And this is something I'm extremely passionate about. I'm running on a slate called Open Victoria. Open Victoria is promoting big changes in our little city. We want independent and accountable government, and I want a more environmentally friendly city. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? My name is Shelley Gudgeon, and I'd like to ask for your support in putting a new, independent voice on Victoria City Council. I'd like to work to engage, empower, and encourage the ordinary and extraordinary citizens of, of our city to create the strong, vibrant, and vital Victoria we want and need for the future. My family and I have built four successful restaurants businesses here in Victoria. We currently own Fifth Street Bar and Grill in the thriving Quadra Village, an Il Terrazzo restaurant in Old Town. I've worked on project with projects with neighborhood associations, business groups, and the city of Victoria. And I passionately believe that the strong neighborhoods are the building blocks of a strong, vital, and vibrant city. Through my experiences, I have learned how vital it is that residents, businesses, and city hall work together and also how to be successful, you have to offer value, quality, and service to the public. I'm afraid that many of us who've worked with City Hall have found ourselves put through layers of bewildering red tape on everything from build, bu building licenses to building a fence. This should not continue. I'd work hard to make City Hall a more open, accessible, accessible and user-friendly experience for everyone involved. I have also learned that success is attainable, one business at a time, one project at a time, and one neighborhood at a time. Village to village, step by step. The start for you as a citizen is to get out and vote on November 19th. Once elected, I will provide a strong voice for the citizens in the neighborhood of our great city and a strong experienced voice for local business. I encourage you on November 9th, November 14th, and November 19th to vote for me, Shelley Gudgeon. I will get things done and I will show leadership. Thank you. Thank you. John Ballinger. Uh, can everyone uh, hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Um, my name is John Valentine, and since running um, for City Council in 2008, I've been very fortunate to meet a wide variety of people, including in uh, three main areas that I've um, become specialized in some, and in some ways of uh, the causes that have been closest to my heart, such as 
the arts, environmentalism, and housing, homelessness, and related groups. And if elected, I'm looking at increased involvement in those areas, as well as uh, increased involvement with the community in general, because I really do feel that there's no point in me voting on things as they come around if I'm not getting my hands dirty realizing what's going on myself. And um, in addition to that, I'm uh, looking at uh, donating practically my entire city council person's salary into, me, into uh, local community projects. And um, that's about it, except uh, one or two quick points. I've uh, lived in Victoria for pretty much my entire life, so we're talking over 30 years. And um, I understand that my uh, email address is part of your handouts. And as well, I've also got a Shaw-hosted uh, website, which is simply votevalentinevictoria.shawwebspace.ca. And for those of you that are Facebook privy, I've also got a Facebook page. And that's about it. And any questions that you have, feel free to um, ask me um, uh, later in the evening. Um, thanks very much. And um, again, my name is John Valentine. And of course, the vote's on November 19th. Have a good day. Thanks. Uh, Kip, Mr. Kempton. Thank you. My name is Robin Kempton. I'm running for councillor. I'm not a politician. I'm a businessman. This is a whole new experience for me, the political world. I'm a businessman with a background, uh, education, BA and MA in economics, and a law degree from the University of Victoria. I work professionally as an economist in the transportation and oil and gas fields in Alberta, and I worked as a lawyer in the workers' compensation system within British Columbia, and ended up as general counsel and corporate secretary for the Port of Vancouver. I own several properties in Victoria, uh, entry-level housing and social housing. I have dealt hands-on, two, three in the morning, with the homeless problem, trying to uh, calm and assimilate uh, the, the homeless in, into society. Uh, the rest of the speakers haven't left me much to go on. Um, they've covered almost every issue, so I'm just going to focus on two or three of them. Um, the first issue I, I, I see is the cost of living uh, in Victoria relative to, to our, our incomes generally. Uh, this is a very expensive city to, to live in, uh, as you all well know. Um, and we have a limited land base, so we're going to have to do something in, in forms of, of density, further density. There's always been a resistance to change. The issue is not so much change, the issue is how to manage the change. And what I will be looking, pushing forward, if, if possible, or asking staff to review, is the, is the question of what we can do with the existing housing stock and create uh, further, further densities, such as taking the older homes in, in James Bay or Fairfield, um, gutting them out and stratifying them into three or four units. In, in the process, taking the, the land base, the cost of that land, and splitting, splitting it into two, three, and four. Uh, I've seen this happen in Vancouver extensively. The, neighbor, the neighborhood is gentrified in the, in the process. Um, the char seconds. Character, neighbor, character of the neighborhood is improved uh, in, in the process. The other issue I, I see is the cost of government. Um, this, this government has been very expensive, as I'm sure some of you know. And finally, I would be advocating um, for the seniors. Uh, the tsunami of, of seniors' population is coming our way daily, monthly, yearly. You all know that. Um, I'm a member of CARP, the Canadian Association of Retired People, and have been to their conference in Toronto this past weekend. And uh, there's a lot of issues with respect to, again, affordability housing, of housing, type of housing, transportation. I will be uh, pushing for those uh, issues at, at council. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sophie Lolly. Can you hear me? Some of you might know me, I'm, I'm a pharmacist. Uh, I have a pharmacy on 1139 8th Street uh, for quite a while now, about 19, since about 1996. Uh, and I decided to run for council because of the state of the downtown, because of, uh, I live downtown uh, as, because my business is downtown, I make a living downtown. And, uh, and so I decided that 
something needs to be done to improve the downtown because it's starting to affect uh, the quality of life for the people in Victoria and for the business uh, profits of the Victoria businesses. Uh, and also, I got endorsed by uh, uh, Open Victoria because of the, I believe that people need to know how decisions are made and how they're not made. Uh, I know that uh, the current council promised uh, recorded televised meetings and we're going to do open uh, openness in the government uh, and this was all promised I think sometime in 2008 and nothing really has happened. Uh, and the other thing that uh, got me into politics or is that uh, I, I disagree with the disparity that's happening out there between the poor and the rich. And part of the example, of course, is our uh, government is just as involved. Uh, if you guys have noticed or not, uh, the management and the uh, councillors and mayor over the last three or four years uh, or six years have got about 30 to 40 percent increase in their wages, whereas the people, the workers, have got roughly 10 percent which I don't think uh, at the times that we are going through that that seems to be appropriate in my opinion. Uh, I am a businessman, but I believe that business need to carry their fair share uh, and uh, do not necessarily feel that uh, the people of Victoria or the citizens should carry the business. Uh, and. There's a few points that I've asked today. I have a little speech made out for the, I thought I'd just mention some of the things that came up while I was uh, talking to you folks. Uh, the LRT, I don't think Victoria is uh, large enough a population to spend money on LRT. Uh, I do not believe that the uh, sewage treatment plant is necessarily the smartest thing to do. Uh, and we need to uh, really watch, to watch that and not spend money unnecessarily. Uh, and I'd like to switch Time. Time. Thank you very much, folks. Sorry. resided in the last um, 27 years in the downtown core. So I've seen a lot of changes and I've spoken out about a lot of different issues and all the issues that I've spoken out about are interconnected. When we look at affordable housing, we can't stop at looking at just affordable housing without looking at our health care system. We can't stop just looking at our health care system without looking at the cost of housing. The people that I'm talking about have paid the price. I've been a part of the uh, council in many different ways when it comes to delivering affordable housing, delivering solutions for the homeless and for health care and for you know various other um, agencies like around delivering employment. I've been a part of that driving force 
that's been quietly in the background, sitting down and consulting with people and bringing them to the table. But never once have I ever asked for the recognition. But now I'm going to ask for the recognition as the first Aboriginal person in over 150 years to be a part of the council Time. from this territory. So I'm going to say, hi, Chikasiyam. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, um, thank all the candidates for council. Um, I think they all deserve a big round of applause. It's quite a little burnout to do. I've been there and done that. Um, and I think it's great that people take the time to step forward in the community and try and serve it. It's a tough choice because there's a lot of good people there. Okay. For our first candidate for mayor this evening, we have Paul Powell. Well, good evening. Thanks for taking the time to come out tonight. My name is Paul Brown. I'm running to be the next mayor of the city of Victoria as part of the Open Victoria Slate. My background for almost the last quarter century, I've been providing financial, procurement, risk, and performance governance to provincial, state, and territorial governments across the Pacific Northwest. I'm not a politician. I have no political affiliations. I will tell you what you need to know, not necessarily what you want to hear. My decisions will be based upon due diligence, not political affiliations or dogma. Together with my peers on Open Victoria, we want to change the way this city does business. First of all, we want to stop the practice of making decisions behind closed doors by a small number of people. We want to make certain that the city of Victoria, the people of the city of Victoria, have the information they need to appreciate the challenges and opportunities that this city is facing, and they are significant. We can't afford to be surprised by things like the Johnson Street Bridge, or as we were a couple of weeks ago, of the pending closure of the Crystal Pool, or the situation of the fire hall. We need to know, we need to all participate in what is going on in this city, not just a select few. And we need to focus Council's attention on the issues that really matter. Too much of Council's attention, and I'm going to estimate 80% is spent on insignificant issues or issues of a global, federal, or provincial nature over which we have very little influence. We need to focus our attention on the issues that are going to make this city great again. And one of those issues is the financial condition of this city. It is ugly. Dean Fortin will tell you everything's okay. I will tell you our financial situation is awful. We've seen services cut. 20% of the Parks and Recreation budget has been cut in the last three years. This year, 40% of the budget for grants has been cut. And we're seeing pending closing of facilities. We do have a financial crisis here, and we've got to deal with it. And we can't be afraid to deal with it. We need to spend our money smarter. It's not an issue of raising taxes further. We can make wiser decisions. Spending six to eight million dollars for 36 places and a couple of travelers' inns, that's $200,000 per person. And I can go on, but I've only got 15 seconds left. And in respect to you, we can have our cake and eat it too. We don't need to cut services. We don't need to raise taxes beyond the rate of inflation. But we have too many people on council who are, un or are afraid to face the challenges, and we do have challenges. We can do better. We must be do better. I thank you. Please give Open Victoria and other independent candidates a serious consideration. This city's future is at stake, and it is serious. Thank you. Oh, there it is. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. I, too, would like to begin by uh, recognizing that we are in the traditional territories of the Squamal and the First Nations. Hajka, thank you and welcome here today. Um, I have greatly been honored to be the mayor for the past three years and running for re-election in the city of Victoria. 
and I recognize that I have before you uh, a brochure that highlights sort of the issues that we've dealt with, some of our accomplishments over the last three years, and highlighted some of the things that we want to move forward and bring in. And I look forward to the opportunity to have a discussion and answer some of your questions. I think though what I also want to do is, is to recognize that City Council each year faces thousands of decisions that we have to make. Issues that aren't on our brochures or highlighted in our issues uh, sheets. And we recognize that for that, you need to be picking people based on who we are, what our values are, and what our beliefs are. Understanding, hopefully, that you're going to elect those people that best represent who you want making those decisions. I am the former executive director of the Burnside Gorge Community Centre uh, and Community School, in which we've introduced and developed family programs, programs for seniors, programs for youth, uh, recreational programs. I've also been the executive director of the Victoria Youth Empowerment Society, which was formerly known as the uh, Association for Street Kids, bringing in and working with youth on job training programs, addiction programs, and outreach. I have a couple of degrees from the University of Victoria in law, in addiction counseling, and geography. I'm a kid from Kamloops, blue collar, single parent background, has spent time working, probably much like you, in gas stations, in sawmills. Um, I serve beer, been known to have a beer once in a while. Um, and I believe that community service is important. It's something that I've been dedicated throughout my life to make sure it's always been part of and what's been raised uh, and how I've been raised is how do you give back to your community? How do you make it a better place? So whether it's been as the treasurer of the Law Center downtown, whether it's been part of the BC Benefits Appeal Board, or more importantly seconds. for me, uh, a coach. Um, I've coached at UVic, I'm sorry, I've coached at Burnside, Squimo, Oak Bay, and I currently coach um, kids in the Victoria Night League. Uh, I have two children. We live in Oakland. I'm a commuter cyclist. I'm a big recycler. Sorry, commuter cyclist and a big recyclist. Um, and that is part of the end of, of who I am in the city of Victoria. I look forward to answering your questions, talk about the issues, our successes, our challenges. But I wanted to start off by saying this is who Dean Fortin is. Uh, and it has been my great honor to be your mayor for the past three years. And I look forward to the opportunity to keep the momentum going. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, I hope I said it right, Steve. Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming down here. I guess I'll be the last person speaking tonight, so we can all get into the uh, more fun uh, aspect of asking questions and talking about policies. Uh, my name is Steve Filipovic, and I'm running for mayor. I've been the sole proprietor of Steve uh, or uh, Filipovic Residential Services, uh, building fences, decks, and doing renovation work in and around the Victoria area for the past 25 years. So I know about housing costs, and I know we could be housing ourselves for a lot cheaper than what's being offered now. I'm also a community activist. I've been uh, working diligently with the Earthwalk Committee for the past 15 years, holding an annual event called Earthwalk, which showcases 30 to 40 different um, nonprofit groups that champion the various issues that our city is facing um, and our region is facing. Um, and that's largely how I won the Monday Magazine endorsement for 2008. Now, we have a crisis in our society. We have learned not to expect anything from our government. But we are living in one of the richest countries in the world, and there is no reason why we should have 20% of our population living in poverty. There is no good reason why young starting families should have to pay half a million dollars for a starter home. So these are the things we can start to address. A crisis is opportunity, and the crisis is lack of participation. The opportunity is to try and wake up your neighbors and your friends. I know you guys are participating, that's why you're here and it's beautiful to see. But there's typically 48,000 people in the city that don't vote. Now I think that a lot of them are paying too much for their rent, and if they spoke up, they could get services like affordable housing. We could start cooperatives, and move people to rent to own opportunities. This would give them a stake in their future. So before we're building bridges and building subway stations or, or light rail rapid transit systems, we should be at least making sure that the residents of Victoria have a stake in the future of Victoria and a, and a more stable future for themselves. So this is your democracy. It's a public office. It's, it's supposed to be open and accountable. Seconds. We fought for freedom of information in the 80s. We won it in the 90s, but we still don't have it. So that's something you should all be thinking about very um, adamantly. We need to know the real information. We're human beings. That means we tweak reality a little bit to make it better. 
but we can't tweak it if we don't know what it is. So we need that freedom of information and we need that accountability. It's your ball, it's your turn to kick it, and it's your turn to score. So please, look for change, vote Steve Filipovic, and look at the other independent candidates running for council. There's some really good up-and-comers, Ben Isaac, Rose Henry, Lisa Helps. Those are my recommendations. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Well, now, um, just take a small break, and I'm gonna, um, I'm not quite sure how we're gonna, I guess we'll just go with it. Okay, uh, and we'll just continue on with the same order we had before. That's fine with everybody, okay? The first question uh, to the mayor's candidates for mayor is on um, the budget. The, the proportion of this, portion of the city of Victoria budget that appears to be allocated to high management salaries, consulting and consulting fees, appears to be larger than for other urban areas, while the proportion that is spent on direct service delivery to residents and business and on infrastructure redevelopment appears to be smaller. Taking into, the account, taking into account the fact that the city of Victoria has lower average household incomes and higher civic taxes than most other jurisdictions of the CRD, how would you approach this issue and redress this apparent imbalance? Paul Ron? Um, I'd agree with the, the, the question and the point that you're making. What we've seen in the first year, uh, Dean, when you're in office, the number of people earning uh, over 100,000 went from 16 to 50. It, it more than tripled. And we've seen salaries increase by 8.1% in the city last year. I spoke to people over at uh, the Victoria Labour Council and their comments was where our workers weren't getting that money. What we've seen is a growth in terms of spending in City Hall in terms of the management and executive team. And yet we've seen cuts in terms of the spending in the boots on the ground, the shovels. We've got to switch that around, okay? We've got to put more focus on delivering the services to people in the field. And we've got to spend less time planning. I can't tell you how many plans I've seen develop over the last number of years that have come out with no funding. And they've gone on the shelf. They've, done, they've been done for political optics. And we've seen another one recently, an economic development strategy that was released a couple of weeks ago for political purposes. Really, there's no budget for it. I mean, why are we doing all of this planning? Why are we spending all this money? Tim, thank you. Thank you very much, and it's a very good question. Um, I want to start off by saying, when someone throws out facts and figures, it's going to be really important that, uh, that, that you would do exactly what I would do uh, to anyone and say, prove it. Can I see your numbers? Can I see where you're getting that information? Just what are you throwing out there? We really can't just be making things up and hoping it sticks. Secondly, we need to make sure that there's context within that uh, piece. So um, we'll talk about later if it's brought up about whether there really have been cuts to budgets and services and 40% here or 20% there. Well, let's address directly the issue that's happened. One of the things that they brought up is saying, you know, is there um, been this large growth from 16 to 50? Actually, what has happened is open government has happened. And part of our reporting and our accounting has come out and said, it's not just the salary that someone gets. We need to report on any extra benefits they have, any travel that they have. And because of that issue, uh, we changed the accounting service uh, two or three years ago, that you now get a full accounting of what, what costs to actually have an employee. And that led to the increase. We haven't actually had, oh, and we also had retro pay, which meant that people got some back pay that, again, increased people into those lines. So we need to understand that. The other issue that people said is we now have high paying or managers. We actually have not, uh, um, if we've created any management position, it's either been seconds. through consolidation uh, of various other positions. So overall, we've not increased how many we have. Uh, the one new position that we have created is we took our high price, contract work, legal services, and brought it in-house. We've lowered our legal costs by making and having a lawyer, but he's reported on there as an employee as opposed to a contract. So I, want, I suspect that you're saying, that's good. I want you to continue to look for efficiencies and how to save money, Mr. Mary. Time. That's Thank what you. I try to do. Thank Steve. you. I 
Well, that is a very good question. I'm unfortunately I'm on the outside of the city, so I don't know uh, exactly what's been going on with how many people they've been hiring or how much they've been paying. But I have talked to some people on the street, the city workers. They're they're feeling very demoralized when um, someone leaves a position for retirement at the city uh, workyard. They're not replacing those people, so that's leaving them feeling that they're not being supported. I know that the city workers don't feel like the, the city is promoting from within and helping their workers work their way up the rank, and instead they're hiring talent from from out of the city. So I would I would change that, reverse that around, and promote from within and invest again within our own community. Uh, there's a lot we could be doing for the way we change things at the city, uh, particularly uh, dealing with the larger corporations in Victoria. We should be reaching out to the smaller businesses. They're the ones that create the lion's share of jobs, and those are the ones we should be supporting to help increase our local economy. Thank you. The next question. Uh, gee, this is sort of asking you to put yourself out of a job, maybe. Amalgamation, and what's your position on it? Let me first say, Dean, those numbers come out of the public bodies' reports. Those are public documents. Uh, the numbers I quoted in terms of reduced budgets come out of your own budget documents. So if they're not right, then obviously you're not leveling with us. Amalgamation, I'm for it. I can't promise it to you. It's a pipe dream. What I will promise to you is I will aggressively work towards amalgamation of services. We have our sanitation workers, a good number of them, retiring in the next few years. Our sanitation trucks, the garbage trucks, need replacement. It's a great time to go to Wisquimo, Oak Bay, and Saanich and say, let's throw our marbles in together. We can create an economy of scale that we can compete very effectively, I think, with the private sector and retain those good paying jobs. Um, policing, I'd love to do it, but let's be realistic. We've poked too many people in the face over that one. I've spoken to Barb Desjardins. She's not very happy. She'd like to stay with the city of uh, the Victoria Police Department, but not the way they're being treated. I'm not proposing to give them an open check, Dean, but I am saying we can work together with Ms. Gwyman, and I think they want to work with us, but we've got to be prepared to work with them. Thank you. Okay. Steve? Hello, I'm against amalgamation. Uh, right now, a lot of people in our society are, are very concerned about how closed off government is. Now, taking down all of our small fiefdoms and, and creating one bigger, larger government would make it more closed off. I want to go the opposite way. I want to create more investments into community centers so that they have more staffing and more resources to deal with the people in their regions so that they can bring what they come to consensus on to the city. And this will give them more opportunity to influence the city hall. Um, the police station, or the police chief, is one of the prime um, proponents of amalgamation, trying to get a regional police force. And their excuse is, we can't communicate with each other. And that's ridiculous. We live in a communication age. They can communicate with each other. So there's other ulterior motives to why they want to um, amalgamate. And what we need to do as a society is to make sure that we keep our policing localized and, and for us, right? Um, particularly community um, policing. That used to be something that, that Victoria had. Uh, the police stations were spread out all around Victoria, and I think that was really helpful to have that maintain a presence um, in Victoria. Um, policing, or rather crime, has been going down since 1972. It's at that level. So we don't need more police. We have poverty on our streets, not crime, and we need to redress that with different issues. But amalgamation, no. We need accountable government, and you need to be able to reach it, so keep it here in Victoria. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Um, pollution. Oh, I'm sorry, Dean. My apologies. I thought these were going to come in me in, in prior tries. That's why I'm counting at the same time. Okay, I apologize. Amalgamation is often seen as something that we can bring the services together, especially when you look at something like policing, to recognize that the bad guys don't recognize borders. If we can make sure that our police forces are working together, sharing information, especially around specialized services, we know that we're going to be more effective, we're going to be more efficient, and we're going to be able to provide better services for everybody in Greater Victoria. Policing is a big issue for us, and we've dealt with it over the last three years with the SCOIMO. Uh, it's been an issue that we've put forward, and we're looking forward in the next couple of weeks to be able to put out a proposal. And you can see what a great deal that we put out to say, we want to continue policing the SCOIMO. We think that's really important. But at the same time, I want to assure you that I will not 
have Victoria residents subsidizing policing in Esquimalt. And that is not, that's not something that we can afford. It's not something that we should move forward on. Amalgamation is a big issue. It's one of those things that we try to move forward at Victoria uh, in an incremental way. For the first time, we have brought forward two motions to the CRD saying, as a region, can we agree on our top five priorities so we can go to senior levels of government and say, these are the five, that we can't be played by senior levels of government who want to get someone elected in this corner and say, let's do an overpass at the airport when we really should have expanded the airport. So we brought that motion together at the CRD to figure out what are our top five priorities and moving forward with that. Okay. We brought forward a motion towards the CRD to say, can we have regional transportation, that everyone needs to be part of this, and for the first time ever, we've had a joint council meeting between mayors and councillors in Esquimalt and in Saanich. Because if we can agree on climate change issues, if we can agree on transportation issues, if we can agree on emergency uh, management procedures, these are issues as a region we can move forward on, look for those efficiencies. We're the ones that have actually been able to deliver some of these programs. We look forward for that opportunity to continue that. And thank you for that. Okay. Um, we have some uh, questions on pollution, uh, just in a generalized sense. I'm going to give you a little, uh, I think a little overrun on that one, so I think I'm going to give you a little overrun on this one. Um, OCP, sustainability, pollution, states, think local, act local. This is kind of a very diverse question. Cruise ship emissions and uh, pollution in general. How are you going to deal with pollution and the pollution issues that face, uh, and, and as well, um, just local, the, the notion I, I think sort of included in this is a little bit of the sustainability and, and gardens, et cetera, all of that. It's a bit of a complex question, but that's the way it's moved up for me too, so. Yeah, well, it's a tough one to ask, I'll tell you. It's a tougher one to, to answer. Um, I think we need to be a lot more aggressive um, in terms of dealing with pollution pertaining to cruise ships. Um, we need to push the uh, Harbour Authority to insist that those cruise ships use low sulfur fuel. They insist upon it up in Alaska, why can't we insist upon it here? I think we also need to move more aggressively in terms of those stinky buses. Um, one way of doing it is to have fewer of them, and the way of doing that would be to, uh, uh, rather than having three cruise ships in town at one time, uh, trying to stay in them a bit. Too many cruise ships at one time just creates too much congestion in this city in terms of pollution. We need to see those buses replaced. Uh, we need to see different types of buses. Those are highway buses. They're not appropriate for here. Uh, we've got an industry here that we want to sustain. But you know what? It's important to sustain tourism. But what about the people that live here? They're important too. And I don't think we're paying enough attention. So can I just speak a, a bit on amalgamation? Twist back on that one, spent my, my last time. Amalgamation, I, I think it's important that we come to the table in terms of dealing with the transportation issue that the Western communities and Saanich are, are dealing with. And I agree with you, Dean, we need a regional transportation strategy. But I would also say to the Western communities in Saanich, if you want us on the table, or at the table, in dealing with a regional transportation problem that's your issue, You've got to come to the table and talk to us about regional policing. You can't expect us to be there for you unless you're there for, for, for us. So, and I'll, I want to work with them. I want to be collaborative, but what's fair is fair. They can't expect us to carry the can on policing and homelessness, but at the same time expect us to come to the table on dealing with their transportation problems. So, thank you. I believe that we should definitely be reducing pollution. Unfortunately, we're a consumptive society and our success is based on how fast we consume things. So we have to challenge this paradigm in our society. Our landfill is filling up and it's got resources in it. We'll be mining Heartland landfill to get the paper fibers and the wood fibers and all these different metals that are in there. That's a resource that's gonna be valued to us soon. We should be um, increasing our zero, a zero waste policy so that products that are made are made with the, their end life in mind so that they, they can be fully recycled, right? We have um, spots in the ocean as big as our continent of, of um, dead water zones, 
filled with, with plastics. And so we should be banning plastics and doing more to be making plastics biodegradable. Um, there's a lot of things that we have to be doing as a society, and, and that's up to the political will of the people. So as mayor of this city, I will create the atmosphere at the community centers for people to get aware of the, inf of the uh, issues at hand so they can create the political will to do that change. As a, as a mayor, we can't do a lot. Uh, we can challenge packaging and a few things like that. But as a population, we can do a heck of a lot more. So that's what I'm offering the, the city of Victoria is a change in that direction where we can be developing the political will to, um, to enhance our environment for the future. Uh, the next one is on, jeez. Uh, oh, Hi, Tim. I'm Dean Porth. Oh, I'm running sorry. For real of the city I'm not doing this. I'm trying to organize things over here. Oh, yeah. Uh, some days you wish you hadn't got out of bed. And that's for me. I've had a few of those days myself. Um, for me, and I'm going to wrap the issue around for this up in, into that larger sense of, of we need to make sure that we continue to deal with uh, climate change. And I know that it's been fairly easy for people to say, let us jettison all the green stuff that we've been trying to do because now as we start to hit into an economic downturn, that we can't afford that. Um, I think more than ever it's crucial that we deal with these issues. We can deal with it in a smart way, that we can save money, we can look for efficiencies. It's the ways we can move forward to build a truly sustainable city. And, and make sure that, that, that we as a city can build a healthy, happy, and vibrant city where we all want to live in our communities and neighborhoods. How are we doing that? Well, um, specifically, some of the stuff we're looking at is we're, we're putting forward an opportunity to pull the organics out of garbage collection. That's something that we feel that we need to move on. We feel it's something that our citizens want us to have. How can we get curbside organic collection so that doesn't go to the landfill? And there may be an opportunity to capture that, either turning into compost, or to use it to generate uh, electricity and heat and something that we can sell. We continue to look at and deal with issues around the cruise ship industry. We know that the um, federal government is bringing in lower, emit lower sulfur uh, content uh, in 2014. We've written them and asked them to make sure that they remain to that commitment and recognize that that will lower the uh, emissions coming out of those cruise ships. More importantly, we led the way to make sure that there's a study to see if we can get shore-based um, power for those uh, ships coming in. For those that don't know right now, when the ships come in, they continue, and they're like 6,000 people, so they're a small city. So they continue to run their diesels to create their electricity while they're in port. And obviously that's giving off greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, obviously that's giving off um, air quality issues. So if we can look and bring in, and if that's the right thing to do, uh, to make plug-ins, then that's the way that we need to move forward working with our partners uh, within the community. I think Climate change is the number one issue. It's still out there. We still need to deal with it. And there's some very smart ways we can move forward. I look forward to the opportunity to deal with it more in depth Thanks. on a one-to-one -one basis. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to really make sure I don't do that again. It's not on purpose. I'm really trying to scramble in here. Uh, the next questions are, it's actually, again, a kind of a two-fold question. Um, as you know, there's been some changes to suggested for Beacon Hill Park. We'd like to ask you how you feel about those. and. Um, it's being grouped together with um, how do we achieve more community gardens. Um, so if you can kind of do a double header in about two, two and a half minutes, that would be appreciated. I'm surprised regarding the Beacon Hill Park situation. I had no idea there was a problem. My wife and I walk through Beacon Hill Park on a regular basis. But you know, I've spoken to people and uh, some people said, yeah, there is a problem. So um, I, I, I'm not going to write it off. Maybe there is a problem. Maybe we need to look at it. In fact, I think there's been a lot of work by people in the community uh, addressing this. I don't know whether we can afford uh, $500,000 to deal with this problem right now. I think we've got bigger priorities. We've got a lot of priorities out there. We've got the crystal pool. We've got sewers. Um, We've been promised a list of infrastructure priorities for over a year and a half now. We still haven't seen it. So to say I'll commit half a million dollars to uh, Beacon Hill Park, I I'm not prepared to do that right now until I know what those other priorities are. Um, we may need to put some traffic calming aspects into that. Um, 
Would it be nice to have Beacon Hill Park without any traffic? Yes, in a lot of ways it would, but it would certainly make it very difficult for some people to access the park. Okay, do you want to address the um, community gardens? The community gardens, uh, I, I welcome it. I think it's a good idea. Um, I encourage it. Uh, I don't know there's a lot of space for it. One of the things that was quite distressing was uh, uh, some young chaps had actually built a community garden on a boulevard up in Fernwood last year. Uh, boy, we got a lot of problems in Fernwood, and uh, here these people actually went out of the way to create a community garden, but the city decided, no, that's not right. Well, there may be some liability issues there, okay? And I, I, I'm not discounting that either, but um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. By the way, we have a community garden in our backyard. I think it's where the outhouse used to be before we, we got in the house. Steve? Um, yeah, for the I'm, I'm giving about two and a half minutes on these, and you can blend whichever way you sure. want to deal with it. Okay, I'm sure I'll need that much time. But anyway, um, yeah, for the road closure of Beacon Hill Park, it's not a priority for me. I would prefer to see the people who are sleeping in the sidewalk um, housed more. I would prefer to see affordable housing created for uh, working families here in Victoria. Um, putting half a million dollars into a project that isn't a necessary project right now, it seems like we should get the things that, are, that have been waiting for 20 years out of the way before we go and continue investing um, in fix-up projects. Um, Harris Green is a prime example of that. $510,000 to put a sidewalk down a green strip. Now that seems like a ridiculous uh, waste of money when that strip was being used by homeless people and now they've been forced off into the shadows further. Right? Anti-kneeling bylaws is not what this city needs. What we need is compassion to do the right thing. We've been spending a lot of money treating people poorly that are left on the streets. Policing poverty is not a solution. We need services. Now, as for community gardens, I'm all for community gardens. We need to have more food security in our region, so we should be promoting more community gardens. It's a wonderful way to meet your neighbors. It's a wonderful way to get organic food grown close to home, which means no fuel needed. That's a very important change that our society should be embracing. We do have limited green space in Victoria, but you can grow a lot of food in a small space because there's a lot of gardeners who have proven that's possible. We could also be planting food vegetables in our uh, city boulevards um, instead of flowers, right? This is the garden city, but that doesn't mean we couldn't be going um, um, zucchinis instead of um, daffodils, right? So there's a lot of potential there. Um, so I'm for that. I believe in transitioning the city toward that type of direction. But I am against silly spending until we get the problems fixed. Let's all get comfortable. Let's all be indoors, and then we can renovate and change the mantelpiece. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dean? Specifically on the Beacon Hill Park issue, one of the things that you community may not know at large, but member, many members may be part of, is that there's been a Beacon Hill traffic management plan in place, and we've been working on it for three years. And there's been more than 300 people engaged in developing that plan. Um, and that's important to us, that we get out and talk to neighborhoods and communities and say, what happens in Beacon Hill? Now, one of the most wonderful things that happens is that now, after three years, it pops up, and people go, what are you guys doing over there? Look at the plan, you know? And we got a lot of people engaged, becoming aware that something's planned for Beacon Hill. Now, City Council said, you know what, this is not an emergency issue. It's not something we need to deal with immediately. Let us stop, take stock, take the plan out to the community and neighborhoods, back out and say, this is what we're thinking of. Make sure you have a clear understanding of what was being proposed and provide another opportunity for community input. And I think that's really important that we continue to get out there and go. And I know in Council we've often you know, been unfairly accused that we have been open and secretive. But I want to say that we had more than 6,000 people engaged in our community engagement uh, strategy involving our official community plan. You know, people say, oh, that pool got surprised and popped on us. Um, we've been out for 18 months talking to it. Um, I've been budget talks at Crystal Pool. I've been budget talks at Cook Street Senior Center. I've been budget talks at coffee shops. And the fun thing about this is Paul's been to all of those. So it's somewhat unfair for him to come up and say, this is the first I've heard about it when he's been at those things and we've been talking about these things. I don't think I want to say investing in parks and public spaces is silly spending. The renewal of Fisherman Work Park, the renewal of Bridge Park, 
the investment that we're putting into our parks and public spaces, those are important to us as neighborhoods and communities. Cities have a responsibility for managing it all. Sewer, water, parks, roads, community centers, rec centers, and it's about finding that balance to make sure that we can build communities, neighborhoods, and cities that everyone feels welcome in and we can address all quality of life issues. Doesn't mean we ignore affordable housing. We've read on the record, it's there, and we continue to want to do it. Thank you. Do you want to deal with the uh, community gardens issue at all? A lot of community gardens help create them in Burnside Gorge. Communities are continuing to have to make them put in, and the city supports them, whether they be in Quadra Village, in parks, on boulevards. We continue to work with communities and neighborhoods because it's important uh, community development, it's important for food security, uh, and it's important uh, for that we look to use public spaces in the appropriate way. City supports community gardens, always have. This council Thanks. always will. Thank you. Um, another question? Um, what, and again, it's a double hitter. I'm sorry, and I apologize, Dean. I've really had to try and sort these out as I go. It's, it's been interesting. Uh, what's your position on uh, LRT and uh, the use of the EN um, right away? It's always a little bit more difficult, always going first. You don't get a chance to think about these very much. But these are easy questions for me, really. I'm not for the LRT at this point. I haven't seen a business case for it. I think there are better solutions, and I have a difficult time, Dean, seeing that you call this your number one issue. You did it at the beginning of the year, you haven't taken that back. Number one issue to deal with the transportation problem for our Western communities. I say you were elected to be the mayor of Victoria, not greater Victoria. As far as the ANN, uh, it's an opportunity, it's a possibility as well. I still think we can fix our transportation problem with a less costly solution, and we shouldn't be coming to the table unless they're willing to come to the table regarding regional policing. It's unfair. Official community plan, Dean, you haven't got any money to implement it. It's one of these other plans that's going to go on the shelf. And no, I was blindsided. I had no idea that you were going to close traffic in Beacon Hill Park. I had never heard about that before. I, I, I would out of my statement. Thank you. I, I, I hope my statements aren't too short for you, but I have some fairly clear feelings in terms of where we should go on this. You can't beat around the bush. you got to be clear. Thank you. Okay. I'm very skeptical of the LRT proposal. Um, it seems like there's a push to put a central station at Walmart. So if you want Walmart to be the center of town, then promote the LRT. I would prefer to revamp the ENN. And I know that there's a cost-effective way we could do that to see, to test if there's um, ridership here in Victoria. There's maintenance vehicles that service railroads or railways, and they have those special wheels that they lower down on the front and back, and then they're locked onto the track. We could buy five or six buses, 30 passenger buses, put them on that track, and then have them coming in in the morning they unlock themselves and drive back on the road, which is empty because everyone's coming in this way. And we can see if those buses fill up with people and they'll be coming into town, you know, they take about 11 minutes. I think it was seven minutes was the, the time that it used to take the streetcar to reach uh, from Colwood to Victoria. So this could be a very cost effective test to see if we have a ridership that's, that's warranted. In the afternoon for that rush hour, we could have the trains, or the buses rather, leaving Victoria on the ENN and returning on the empty highway we have, right? And that would create a loop uh, for service and we would see right away whether people actually wanted to get out of their cars. The problem with LRT and um, public transit is a lot of people vote for them in the hopes that everyone else will be riding the bus so that they can get on the road that's open. <laughs> Right? And now this is a big problem. So that's my idea. Um, was there a second part of that question? Uh, gee. Okay. Oh, just, just the LRT and the ENA, and I think you've answered both of them. Uh, yes. Thank okay. you. LRT is something that the city needs to look at. And I want to highlight something that I've heard that before. I heard someone say, well, there's no congestion in downtown Victoria. The congestion is, is, is just really from Langford to Uptown. There are 30,000 car trips each day from Langford to Uptown. 
there are 200,000 trips from uptown to downtown Victoria. If you take a look, congestion is in our downtown. And if we don't deal with it, we are challenging ourselves to say to people, they're gonna start moving out of town. You already see, I mean, we have an economic development strategy for the city of Victoria. Everybody else's economic strategy is trying to convince businesses to move out. If we want to have a healthy, strong economy where we can pay for these things, we need to understand that our downtown holds 45% of all the jobs in the region. That our downtown businesses and companies pay 50% of our taxes. That these are important and if they move out, it's a difficult for us to continue to make sure that we can pay for the things important. So we ignore at our peril to allow our streets to continue to be congested. And absolutely, it scares me when someone says, okay, let's run light rail from Langford to Uptown and stop there. I've heard it described that Uptown is now the center of Victoria, or will become the center of Victoria, of Greater Victoria. We need to make sure that we're protecting our interests, and we need to make sure that we're moving forward. We also need to do it smartly. One of, so let's put it in context, and I'm, and I'm sorry if it's going to be a bit of a longer bit, if you're going to talk about it, it's got to be in context. Yes. Phase one, $750 million. I think we go from here to six mile, we don't need that extra $250 million until a long time in the future. So let's talk about $750 million. The cost of doing business as usual, buses, route, bus routes, over the next 20 years is $250 million. If we can get the federal government and the provincial government to cost share to come in with their two thirds, then we can get light rail for the cost of business as usual, of more buses. And all of those buses on the Douglas Street corridor and those service hours included within that cost go throughout. So even if you are in Oak Bay or Sydney or anywhere else in the community, you're gonna get more bus services, more buses and more bus service in your community. So we need to take a look at it, but we have to do it smart. I want an independent business study to make sure the numbers are correct. And you know what? If we can just put paint down and do an HOV lane and that solves our problem, I am so happy to start there and do it first. And let's do that first. If it delays the expense over the next five or 10 years, then we can take a look at it. If it doesn't lurk, we say, the LRT is gonna run where the little diamonds are. Uh, thank you. Okay. Um, I can talk about E&N, but I ran out of time. I saw you do yeah. that. So. Yeah, I'm sorry. I am trying to be as fair as possible, okay? It's a little tricky. My, my beautiful, beautiful Blackbird very I have beside me has vanished, so I'm really trying to keep it fair. Um, Next question is, uh, do you have any plans to create affordable housing? And this is kind of a double-edged sword, too. And um, the second part that they're asking in their same question is, is can you, do you have any innovation, innovative ways of doing it without costing millions in tax dollars? Uh, yes, I do. A lot of it comes through what the city is prepared to allow. There are entrepreneurs out there who are trying to create affordable housing, whether it be for rent or for purchase, and every time they come to City Hall, they get an answer of no. There are developers out there who are willing to take the risk. We've got to listen to what they have to say. We can't simply turn them down. Let me say this as well. Uh, Dean, you say, uh, they will move out to the western communities. They already are moving out to the western communities. Have you seen the empty storefronts downtown? It's already happening. And in terms of an economic development strategy, it's not much in there. In fact, most of it tends to focus on Greater Victoria. Where were the rest of the municipalities? Again, Dean, you were elected to be mayor of Victoria, not Greater Victoria. Focus on being mayor of Victoria. And as far as the feds or the province, stepping up to the table to fund LRT. That's our money too. And I can tell you that my discussions with the feds in the province, the attitude is we don't want to do business with Victoria. They keep poking us in the eye publicly. We want to do business with municipal governments that are willing to work with us collaboratively rather than poke us in the eye. So, I'm sorry, again, Tim, it's hard going first to get the retort in. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess this is actually coming at three different levels. Uh, I guess it has a lot with the... I ask a question too? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. 
I am sorting through so much stuff here that is so chaotic. If you had any idea, you could come and look at it and tell me. I don't want to get there. Yeah, I know, um, Steve. I do have some ideas for affordable housing. Uh, first off, the most affordable housing is home ownership because it pays for itself and then it's yours. So that's a huge asset. So my, my, uh, my idea is we have a lot of people in Victoria who rent 63% of Victorians rent. A lot of them are paying enough rent to support a mortgage, but they can't get a mortgage because they can't save up a down payment because they're paying too much for rent. What we can do as a city is help them form small cooperatives, allow them to buy a house together, help them with the renovation process, make sure that they can suit their needs with this new um, cooperative housing, and then they would be joint owners and getting equity in their house. This would give them a viable future. It is, it is not good for us to hold a large portion of our working class in rental traps, okay? Now this will also take the pressure off the rental market and it should start to lower the rents for everyone else as landlords start to become more wary and realizing that if they charge too much for rent, people will take advantage of a new program and they will go to become owners. Uh, the other thing we can do is stipulate that more percentage of the new buildings become rent to own so people can get, again get in there without large down payments which seem to be a hindrance. So this is my idea for, for cooperative housing uh, and, um, and rent to own. I think it would be a real good asset for the 63% of Victorians who are stuck in their rental situation. Thank you. Dean? I love this question because we really rocked on housing and we continue uh, to make it happen and we want to make it happen. I have a sheet on housing highlighting all the stuff we've done things we want to do. We want to make sure that you get a chance to take a look at that. Um, we recognize that affordable housing is important. I do want to highlight one thing. You know, you cannot just say this is affordable housing and that's justification for City Hall to approve substandard housing and then come forward and say, but that's the only way I can make money off of poor people. We are going to make sure that we build housing in the right way. Uh, we need to make sure that the housing supports are there. We've seen bad developments happen in this town. You know, and, I, and so we need to make sure that we're going to do it right. I want to make sure that we highlight that. There's no shame in going to the federal and provincial governments. In fact, that's how we're going to get through a lot of our issues that are important, to ask them for money. And, and it's nice and quick to say, that's our money. But you think they're going to give it back to you if they don't give it to us? Or do you think the federal government's going to spend that money in Toronto or Moncton or someplace else? So don't you think we should be there to say, these are our infrastructure priorities, these are our priorities, and we need to bring it here. Um, I've also had conversations with the writing people, and I'm happy to say, oh sorry, first of all, I'm still very deeply disappointed that the provincial government did not come in and support the Johnson Street Bridge. That was a way for all of the region to support that. But you know what, the federal government gave us $21 million, and they're willing to do and work with Victoria. And they just gave us another $8 million. So we're now down to $41 million of boring for that bridge. And we're waiting for another $8 million, hopefully, that we'll get from them. And we'll continue to bring those costs low. So we're going to continue to work with the federal government, provincial government, and find those infrastructure funding, whether it be for pipes, sewer, roads, or most importantly, for affordable housing. I'm looking forward to introducing market rentals. We know that if we can get more rentals in this town, if we can make sure that seniors and young people have a place to live and to start that that's extremely important. We're continuing to doing subsidized rentals for the hard to house, make sure that the supports are there so that they can be successful, and we look forward to introducing new programs. Any ideas that come up with, whether they be co-op or all the great stuff that, uh, that's happened in the community neighborhoods, they're all good ideas. Housing is important. We need to make sure that everybody can afford to live in the city, and that's what we want to do in the next few years. Thank you. Okay. Next question is, uh, what initiatives would you support if elected to enhance open government in the city of Victoria? Initiatives I would support uh, would be upgrading our city website to make certain the information is there in terms of work, who people, what, how councillors are voted, mayor voted, uh, making it easier to navigate that website. I would change the nature of communications in the city of Victoria from holding information back and protecting the city as much as possible to, and, and, and spinning that information, 
to the default being the information goes out unless there's a good reason for it not to go out. I like Governor Gregoire's approach down in Washington State. When she came to office, she said, the emphasis has been on withholding information. I want to change that. I want to put it out there so that the information goes out by default. Okay. And I would like to uh, substantially reduce, if not eliminate, the communications department so that individual department heads could answer for their own rather than being spun through communication. So, uh, Tim, I go on in this one at length. Take a look at what Governor Gregoire's down, down in Washington State. She's a marvelous example of how things can be changed. Thank you. Steve? I, too, support a more open and accountable uh, government. I would change the website. It is a little tricky to find information there. You get kind of lost. Uh, we should have public liaison officers who can help people find pertinent information. Remember, this is a public... Well, I can't find that word. It's a public office. It's run for you, by you. So you should have the information at your disposal before contracts are signed. You should be able to look and see what, what, what's being tendered out. We should be allowing more companies to bid on these contracts so that we have better, lower bids from local companies that make local employment. We should be um, increasing our web presence. We should be funding our community centers with more information, more staffing, and more resources so that people in their community can find out what's going on. And then they can react to that. That's what, it's very special. If you're a human being, you need to know reality so you can tweak it that little bit. If you don't know reality, what you're tweaking is wrong. So the more we know about our situation, the better it is. Like I said, we fought for freedom of information. We still don't have it. We now have one of the most closed off governments we've had in Victoria, so I think it's time that we have change. So please support that change. Thank you. So I'm sorry, I beg to differ. I don't think we've had the most closed off government. In fact, I think we've done a remarkable job, and I think there is a lot more that we can do. As I said before, our official community plan, we had more than 6,000 people engaged in part of that. Our downtown consultation plan, um, our youth council programs, everyone's been out there. I remember talking to more than 600 kids uh, in their schools saying, what do you want your city to look at? We've had a really open run. Um, we've adopted a public engagement strategy. How can we better engage people? Whether it be talking about parks, whether it be talking about infrastructure projects, whether we be going forward. We're working and we're waiting for, momentary at any time, for our new website to get in. So it can provide more opportunities for web streaming, for better searching devices, for an opportunity to get those. But I want to make sure, and also we've taken the mayor's open door, and it's gone from once a month to every to once every two weeks. And we recognize that people have made it difficult for people to come down to City Hall. So now every second week, we've been going out to coffee shops, whether it be in Cook Street Village, whether it be in you know, the James Bay Coffee Shop, and other places. But there's so much more work that we can do, and we really are looking forward to bringing that in. We need to build a searchable database, so we need to make sure that we record uh, council's votes, not only who just voted against, which we record, and you've got to do the work to figure out whoever's not on that list voted for it, um, to make sure that that's there, that you can have live web streaming. I've got to tell you, someone at the last meeting said, I, you know, they should be calling the cops because people are going to kill themselves out of boredom in this thing. So it's probably not going to be the most interesting TV, but there's a chance to be there. We need the automatic release of city hall reports that do not re require confidentiality, and we're looking for enhancing our interactive and online services. What it's really about is making sure that people get access to information, that they have an opportunity to know what's being decided on, and it helps inform their choices, and it helps us inform uh, what, our, what we're hearing from our citizens. So we look forward to the work that we've done, and we're really looking forward to the work we're going to do to continue. But as someone once said, you need to understand that all of our stuff is published a week ahead of time, so you get to read it and show up. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work. We just need to make it easier for people to get that information that is out there. And as a total aside, all our tenders are public. We always do public calls for tender. Um, it's part of the requirement under the, uh, uh, part of what required by law to do. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know what your sense of it is. We're running a little late into the evening. Do you guys want to, I've got a few more questions, and I think we've done an amazing job tonight. I never would have dreamed we would have gotten through. One more. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is, uh, 
I'm going to try and get a couple more in here, but what I'm actually going to try and do is I'm going to try and shorten you up to one minute so that that way we get, uh, you know, at least some sense of it. We've done a pretty good job, better than I expected. Okay, the question, just a one minute response. Yes and no would be perfect. Um, would it be possible to at least enforce pedestrian crossing laws or barrier yet not emulate Calgary? And I assume a Calgary. Yes, Okay, would it be, uh, the concern here is people are saying they don't feel as pedestrians, their, their right to cross is being respected, and what would you do as mayor? Because the mayor comes with the police board. Well, I, I tend to agree. My wife and I cross, uh, use a crosswalk on Burdett, uh, uh, excuse me, on Vancouver at Burdett, and it's like uh, dodging cars. I think it really comes down to the fact that um, at least the crosswalk we use, uh, hasn't been painted in years. It, most people don't know what's a crosswalk. Um, I think there needs to be more effort and resources put into that, but because the city is so broke and tight for resources, I don't think those things have been done. Uh, as far as enforcement, Tim, uh, enforcement is always something that, that, that makes sense, but I think, I, I don't think people run through crosswalks because they don't know, uh, because they, they're not paying attention. A lot of times, they're not visible. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's a yes or no answer, right? Close. Well, I'm just trying to get as many of these off the table now as I possibly can. So, we'll go with Steve. Our city's been taking crosswalks out because people feel comfortable in them. So they've been, they're like the one on Blanchard, they took that out so that people now have to run across. They, they, they you know what I mean? It makes, them, it makes them pay more attention to what they're doing. So this isn't quite right. I helped build a crosswalk by Langford School, and it was um, what we did was we we imprinted into the asphalt and then painted it so it looks like brickwork. Now that makes the crosswalk stand out. It looks very attractive. It's not that expensive. So I think we should be doing things like that. So it's actually quite a, a nice thing. But I do support um, crosswalks, and I think that pedestrians should be safe from automobile traffic. But we should be calming down the automobile traffic. Okay. The city remains committed to pedestrian friendly cities. We continue to put in more crosswalks. We continue to, I'm all for painting crosswalks. Um, we continue to make it more safer. What you do need to understand that uh, although you are mayor, you are chair of the police board, you do not have the opportunity uh, to say, I want you to enforce this more. Um, there is a big division between policy and civilian oversight and actually giving your police operational directions. That's in there so you don't have Frankly, politicians abusing their authority and having people they don't like arrested and all their friends not arrested, it makes sense. Um, having said that, you have the opportunity to say, please increase enforcement in this. And within the context of the operational demands, uh, obviously your traffic uh, people do that. But you gotta know, the priority one calls will be priority one. If you gotta go to uh, someone where some life safety issue is there, that's where you're gonna happen. But as a city, we can continue to invest in our pedestrian infrastructure to make it safer for people to cross and uh, make our city more livable and sustainable. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, everybody got that one? Okay, these are actually gonna be close to yes and no. Um, will you allow uh, all special interest groups to set up camp in Centennial Square? Just make it yes or no? No. I support the Occupy movement. Okay, Dean? It's not as easy as yes or no, so let me say this. You do not start by saying, we will start with conflict, and we will start by violence removal. If we have an opportunity to deal with people with compassion, respect, and peacefully find a solution, why is that not your starting base? Do not get me wrong, we remain committed to make sure that the events happen in that square, and we're continuing to negotiate them, and if necessary, we will take action. Um, but at this time, I'm gonna to continue to work for a peaceful solution, and not automatically go towards using force. He's just supposed to be, yeah. I know it's it's difficult to do it. I'm just trying to get as much input as I can. Um, yeah, this is pretty mother of it too. How will you, uh, would you work towards creating a safe environment in Victoria for gay, lesbian, transsexual, bisexual, and I'm not gonna, I don't know what a two-spirited whatever community is. I guess I'm old. Of course I would, yes, definitely. Just a yes or no? Yeah. Okay, Pete? Yes, but I will say that this, for this, this term, this is the first time ever that Mary and Council have marched at a team in every gay pride parade. 
Okay, it's one thing to say yes, it is another thing to actually get out there and be on your feet and stand out in front and say that everyone is welcome in our city. That's important. I guess the last question, and I know it's going to be really quick, and, but there is, it, it is very hard to encapsulate, and I, I think it's an issue that's near and dear to uh, quite a few James Bay residences, hearts, as we look at the huge condos that surround us that we built in the last 10 years that are absolutely empty. Um, I guess uh, it's come out in three different notes and three different questions in various ways. Um, well, how are we going to cope with that issue? Because it's, we've actually got more building volume in this community than we've ever had. We've gone through the largest building boom ever and our population is dropping. So the question it pertains to luxury condos that have been built in the, in the area over the last little while? Vacation homes. I don't think we have to worry about them anymore. The market is saturated. We made the mistake and we allowed them to be built. We're stuck with them now. I don't think we're going to see any more. The market is saturated. My wife and I walk through what was once the Humboldt Valley. It's dark at night. Those people don't live in town. so. I, uh, and, uh, by the way, in terms of the uh, uh, Occupy Victoria movement, I don't want violence. I mean, we've, we've got to be compassionate, but come on. It's gone on long enough. Steve? Steve, quick comment on this? Sure. And this will be the last question, by the way. We've almost got through everything. I am completely flabbergasted. Yeah, our, our city's been serving real estate speculators before they're serving the citizens of Victoria. So we need to really stand up and make it that everyone gets out and votes for affordable housing because it, claim your stake in Victoria, right? Um, the realtors are certainly doing their job of claiming their stake. So you need to get in front of the line. You guys are the majority of Victoria, so demand services from City Hall and you'll get them. If you take a look, you'll see that uh, over the last three years that the City of Victoria has um, looked to uh, put in what I would call is market housing at the lower end. Uh, we're seeing a lot more smaller units being created, whether it be the Juliet building, the new 834. That's where the market has turned. It's what we've been encouraging. The city has been about creating affordable housing. It's been about creating housing that everyone can live in. I'm not worried about the rich people. For some reason, they seem to do very well by their own. Uh, my concern, of course, is about the working poor, uh, the hard to house, and seniors and young people who are starting out. That's where we're focusing our attention. That's where we know that we can make sure that this city is open and welcome for everyone, and that's what we'll continue to do. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to... Uh, can we sum up 30 seconds each? 30 seconds each sum up. Well, I've, I've, it just, you know, it's, it's hard when you're so close to getting almost every question answered. You, you just want to try and get it done. Can we all give Tim a hand? Really. Thank you for listening. As I say, I'm not a politician. Uh, I'm going to tell you sometimes what you don't want to hear. We're not isolated from the rest of the world. We do have a financial situation. We've got to deal with it. It can be fixed if we start now. I love this city. It's a gem. Let's keep it as a gem. Let's not allow it to continue to spiral down. I'm asking for your vote on election day for both me and the other three candidates who are running on open Victoria. Let's open up Victoria. Let's make it work again. It can work again. And again, thank you very much for your patience tonight. Okay. civically uh, for the last three elections, well this will be the third election, and my very small money campaigns have been eroding the power that the larger campaigns hold over our democracy. So I want you to know that if you want the strings of influence cut from behind City Hall, and you want a real democracy to function here in Victoria, then go out into your neighborhood, gather up your friends and neighbors, and come in and vote for Steve Filipovic on November 19th. And also look into supporting Ben Isaac, Rose Henry, and Lisa Helps. All very good, dynamic, independent people who will do their best job for you. That's for everybody, not for the vested interests that control our democracy. Thank you very much.
I do want to take a quick second to recognize and thank all of the volunteers from the Community Association and the Community School who have worked to put this on. Thank you. This is what democracy is about. I want to thank all of the participants, the people who are, are, have been, are crazy enough like me to put their names forward uh, and say, you know, we want to make a difference in our, in our city. We hope that you'll look at us all, evaluate us, and then choose the ones that best reflect your value. And probably most importantly, I want to thank you for coming out. Our democracy only works when people are interested in investing in their investing their time into finding out who's running their cities, who they want to run the cities, and how we can have that. For me, um, I see our city as continually getting better. We've done a lot of good work, and I want to keep that done. I got in in 2008, and downtown disorder was a big issue. And it wasn't related to homelessness. It was related to the social disorder that was happening uh, in our late night service. We're down 26%. And you know, I had business leaders come up and say, I want, I'm concerned about those two panhandlers on the street. And then they took a step back and laughed. He said, thank you for dealing with the homelessness issue in such a strong and fundamental way, because now I only got to worry about those two panhandlers. In the old days, I couldn't see them. And it's because we took the compassionate route, which was finding homes and houses. And we'll continue to do that. So I think that in my mind, that we have an amazing city, we're going to continue to move it forward. We're going to deal with the challenges that are there, and we're going to make sure that everyone can afford to live in this city. Thank you for your opportunity. I would like your support to keep the momentum going. Thank you so much. Okay, we ran a little out. I'm going to ask a favor of everybody, and it's uh, if you know how one of these chairs folds, it would be really appreciated. We're running late now. Uh, there will be a little bit of time for candidates to engage you. So can um, I show you a trick? As running a community center, you put your foot here, and you do this. Yeah, and we're going to get trained, we're going to get uh, wagons into the middle. But it, as well, if some of you really want to talk to somebody that you met tonight, uh, or, or didn't get a chance to talk to, feel free to do that. It's just the old, many hands make the light work. Thank you all for coming.